Thank you for joining us, Brian. Great to have you with us. So, from accelerating, yes, so from accelerating uh, expansion of the universe to accelerating climate change, what do you think is the greatest challenge uh, for us to actually make what's needed uh, in climate change? Well, I think it's actually getting collective action around the globe and realizing that this is a 50-year whole of humanity problem that we have to solve together. And that is a real wicked problem that humanity has never done. We have never worked collectively to the scale that we need to. COVID-19 is a good example of how we managed to immunize the developed world, but we haven't figured out how to, uh, to do the developing world. And we're, we're seeing the problems uh, you know, manifest themselves in a one year time scale. So hopefully we're gonna learn from COVID what happens with climate change if we fail in the same way, uh, which is to bring the whole world around. Uh, isn't that what governments usually say that it's not possible to do anything if we don't wait for China, for example? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, but I think China is going to move with us. And the challenge is we all have to move together because we're all on the same planet Earth, you know, and we sink or swim together. And yeah, we can often look at China. I'm not worried about China. I'm much more worried about my home country of the United States and Australia. We emit more, you know, uh, per capita than they do. So we need to get and work together on this. Mm. So... Uh, there are other academic scholar, scholars that actually say, well, climate change is a problem, but it's not the end of the world. We will, we will manage. What do you say to that? It certainly isn't going to be the end of the world. Cockroaches will outlast whatever we do with climate change, but we can make life very challenging for us. So some of the scholars, uh, economists uh, from a certain frame of uh, economics, and I'm married to an economist, so I think about these all the time, but their arguments are based on a series of assumptions that I think are quite limited uh, and pose a huge amount of risk if any of those assumptions are wrong. And I think there are many reasons to believe that many of those assumptions are. So we need to sit back and not take one narrow view of the problem. We need to make things easy for us. We need to think about the whole range of risk and make sure that we take what is a collective decision that is the best for everyone. Uh, and I am concerned about the level of risk that we're already taking. Uh, and I think most economists uh, would agree with me, uh, but there are always gonna be sustaining views and we should listen and learn from them. But I think what we need to do is to minimize the risk rather than maximize it uh, in the hope of getting some economic optimization that may be deeply flawed based on the assumptions that it's based on. So what do you think we have to do? So uh, multi-pronged, the first thing we do is we need to decarbonize our energy as fast as we can. Start with electricity, that's easy. We need to start then looking at each place that we're uh, creating emissions uh, that are leading to increasing the greenhouse gas. And we have to figure out how to solve it in the developed work world, but also the developing world. And that means figuring out how to get energy at scale to Africa, to Southeast Asia, in addition to ourselves. Mm. We're also gonna have to adapt. There is no way that change is not going to occur at a scale that is uncomfortable. Already my vineyard here in Australia I'm planting new varieties and adding all sorts of equipment to cope with unprecedented weather changes. Uh, and some of which like bushfires, I haven't been able to mitigate. So we're gonna have to be very systematic in adaptation, new grain varieties, going through and figuring out how to deal with uh, sea level rise, providing resilience in our communities. Uh, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to look at the geopolitical structures what are we going to deal with the people of Kiribati here in the Pacific? They're not going to have a place to live. And we need to start working on those geopolitical issues because some things are not solvable 
And we need to give everyone on planet Earth a place to have a dignified living. And that means actually doing some sacrifices because we've already made that happen. We've done enough damage, that's happening. What about like urbanization? People are more and more moving into cities. How will a city be able to cope with the climate change, do you think? So cities are actually quite a good uh, weapon against climate change and adaptation because we can concentrate people, we can make them very efficient, and we can uh, essentially uh, make them so that they can adapt more efficiently to climate change. But cities themselves are not sufficient. You need to have the cities for most people and then build resilient systems in the rural and regional areas that are going to still have to grow the food and do things uh, that are required of the land. So I think the design of the city is a place where we can get some really good efficiencies and adaptation, but then we need to build a political system that creates a resilient area around the cities and not just pretend that we're going to let the market sort it out. I think you're going to need to have some kind of people engineering here to make it work well. That's great. Thank you so much, Brian, for joining us today here with your great thoughts on this. Thank you. My pleasure, and I wished I was there in person. <laughs>